Good morning. Thank you for joining us for the Connect SF webinar. My name is Tam Tran. I'm with the San Francisco Planning Department. And today I have with me my Connect SF colleagues, Linda Meko from the County Transportation Authority and Kanzai Uchida from the Municipal Transportation Agency. Together, we will be presenting information about the Connect SF Statement of Needs and answering your questions. In order to submit a question, please find the submission icon on the bottom of your screen. It looks a little like a thought bubble, and you can click on that and type in your question. We will pause during parts of our presentation so that we can respond to your questions, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If we don't get to your question during this webinar, please feel free to email us, and we'll get back to you. Our email is connectsf at sfgov.org. A couple more housekeeping issues before we start. Please keep your micro Please keep your computer's microphone muted so that unintended sounds are not broadcast during the webinar. And also, keep your video disabled. Again, thanks for joining us, and let's jump into the presentation. Here is our agenda. First, we'll give you a brief overview about Connect SF and the Statement of Needs, what it is and what it's for. Next, we'll discuss some key findings from the Statement of Needs and then we'll discuss next steps for the Connect SF program. Finally, we'll walk you through one of the data visualization maps we prepared to help illustrate some key findings that came out of the statement of needs. So a brief recap of Connect SF. Connect SF pulls together the city's transportation planning efforts into one coordinated program. Our agencies are collaborating to streamline long range transportation planning efforts. Through our partnership and community engagement, we will identify major transportation investments and policies that are needed for the next 50 years. We will also integrate land use into our transportation planning efforts since these two areas are related and interdependent. Last year in the spring, we completed the first phase of work for Connect SF, which many of you were a part of. This involved developing a vision for what the city would be like in 50 years. This work was informed by an, by an extensive outreach process, which included members of the Features Task Force. Briefly, the vision is one where San Francisco is a growing, diverse, equitable city. There is a multitude of transportation options that are available and affordable to all. There is also faster project delivery, resulting from strong civic and government engagement. These are the five goals that shaped the Connect SF vision and that we will use to guide the city's long-range transportation planning, forward, planning work moving forward. In other words, the vision and these goals will guide our studies and all our projects and policies that emerge from our collective efforts. So that was phase one of Connect SF, to lay the groundwork and create a long-range vision that would frame the rest of the work that we do. We're now in phase two. During this phase, we'll focus on needs and challenges for the future, given our current transportation system and the projects we have planned. Today's presentation focuses on the statement of needs. If we want to reach the vision, then we need to understand where we are today and then identify gaps or deficiencies we have to close to reach the vision. Those challenges are discussed in the statement of needs. To meet, the to meet the challenges we thought today, we will develop project concepts for our transit, streets, and freeways as a part of phase two. In the third phase of Connect SF, we will publish two main items, the San Francisco Transportation Plan and a new transportation element for the city's general plan. The San Francisco Transportation Plan is a citywide long-range investment and policy blueprint for our city's transportation system. The plan analyzes every transportation mode, every transit operator, and all streets and freeways every four years. The projects prioritized in this plan will inform Plan Bay Area, which is the region's long range transportation and land use plan. The transportation element of the general plan will guide the city's transportation policy and projects in the coming years and codifies them in the city code. Priorities for transit, streets, and freeways 
developed in phase two will be formalized as policies in a new transportation element that Connect SF will develop for the general plan. The statement of needs establishes a baseline understanding of how San Francisco's transportation system is performing today and in the future. The statement of needs seeks to answer the following questions. Does this performance meet the goals and aspirations set out in our vision? If it doesn't, what are the gaps or areas that where we need to do additional work to reach the vision? We use the TA's travel model to understand current and future conditions and identify key challenges for ConnectSF to address. The major inputs in the travel model were land use and the transportation system. We then developed metrics corresponding to the vision's goals and objectives. The travel model gave us outputs for 2015 to measure today's conditions and for 2050 is our future year. So let's first cover population and job growth to get a sense of the big picture for 2015 and 2050. San Francisco will continue to grow because it is and will be an attractive place to live and work. The rest of the Bay Area will grow even more than San Francisco. Our growth projections are based on the city's development capacity and it includes adopted plans and policies like citywide development sites, large developments and plan areas, accessory dwelling units, and others. As for employment, employment is also expected to grow at historical rates, about 5,000 jobs annually. Population is expected to grow faster than it has in the past. In the previous 35 years, population growth was just under 6,000 people per year. In the future, we are projected to grow about 10,000 people annually. Where are we growing? Where will this projected growth, growth go? In this slide, we show the projected change of where people live and work from 2015 to 2050. The vast majority of planned increased growth will occur in the eastern parts of the city. This includes the city's major developments and area plans that have been approved. So that was land use. Let's go over how transportation fits into our model. For the year 2050, we took the transportation network assumptions from Plan Bay Area 2040. These include large infrastructure projects in the region and transit capacity improvements. Examples include Central Subway, the downtown extension and expanded service for Caltrain, more BART service through San Francisco's core, express lanes on 101 and 280, and others. So let's review what we just discussed about our approach to the model and how we got to the statement of needs. The major inputs into the travel model are land use and the transportation system. The model will give us a baseline understanding for existing and future conditions if we did no further planning. Our follow-on studies will identify project concepts and policies based on these needs. I'd like to pause here to respond to questions that we've received. Um, again, if you have questions, please type them in. And we do have one question already. And this question is, how are Vision Zero priorities set by MTA included in this process? So I'm gonna um, give this to my colleague, Kanzai, to respond to. Thank you, Tam. Uh, my name is Kansai Uchida from the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Um, the Vision Zero priorities uh, in terms of safety and livability are included uh, in the uh, statement of needs. Uh, as you'll see in a slide that's coming up, um, safety and livability is one of the core challenges that we're trying to meet with our work. And uh, the recent data we have from Vision Zero shows us that um, this is an area where we still need to focus as we move forward with Connect SF. Thank you, Kanzai, for answering that question about Vision Zero. A second question we got is, why is population projected to grow faster than employment? So if you look at the slide about population 
and where it's growing, which is slide 10. Yes, and we have these, the city has a lot of development sites and area plans that are, that have been approved and adopted. And these, these, um, these area plans will, will increase housing units and jobs. For example, in Central Soma, we're projected to have 8,800 8, housing units for that area plan. For the hub, if there's gonna be over 9,000 housing units in those areas as well. And part of the publishing growth is a way for us to balance our jobs, work jobs balance, um, work jobs ratio. What near-term improvements are planned for public transit? Why wait? And I'll pass it on to Steve Tanner to answer. Thanks, Sam. This is Keith Tanner from the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. And so it's a great question, and we certainly don't want to wait to the end of all of this work um, to address uh, transportation improvements. And in fact, um, there are a number of uh, major projects planned and <coughs> development at the moment. As Sam referenced some, uh, we have BRT planned for Van Ness and Geary. We also have our central subway opening soon, as well as other regional connections. Uh, planned for the city. Um, in addition, we are um, expanding and replacing our fleet, which is already the greenest uh, transit fleet in the nation and is on track to be um, fully electrified by the year 2035. Um, additionally, we every two years update our short range transit plan for um, planning uh, purposes to see um, a much uh, smaller time window. We have a, another question. What methodology is used and what community engagement is used to assess transportation needs? And can you is going to take that question for this year? Thank you, Pam. I'll start with the second part of that question. As some of you and most of you were involved during our vision and things, Process. That involved over 60 organizations and over 5,000 individuals that we interact with, interacted with via surveys, pop-ups on the street, as well as uh, the focus groups and meetings uh, with community-based uh, organizations. And through that process, uh, if you recall, we did identify the, the various goal areas of the ConnectSF vision. And from that, um, that is where our methodology, uh, the, the goals of the Connect SF vision is the framework for our methodology. And as Pam mentioned in her introduction, we use um, those goal areas to develop objectives uh, that would lead us towards the vision and related, have related metrics associated with those objectives. And then we have a follow up question. Um, how does this work tie into Vision Zero? Um, so that's a, another great question um, that refers back to our original goals and guiding principles. Um, our Futures Task Force identified uh, one of the key guiding principles as safety and livability. And so that guides um, all of the work that we're doing for our vision um, process as well as the phase two work here. We identified metrics and ways to measure our performance according to the safety and ability objectives. Uh, and of course, our city has a goal of reaching zero fatalities by the year 2024. Thanks, Keith, for answering that. So we're gonna go on to another question that we got. How were the land use projections developed for the region, the city, and for each analysis zone? So our approach to the city of needs was to pull together all the standard policies that are in place today in San Francisco and the region. So as I mentioned earlier, this included things like our local policies related to density, density bonuses, 
especially during units such as granny flats, as well as plans that we have adopted. This includes plans like the Central Soma, the Hub, Transit Center District Plan, and so forth. These plans and policies will use the highest number of new housing units as well as jobs. For example, Central Soma, there's a projected 9,000 housing units out of that plan. For the Hub, there'll be about, also about 9,000 units that come from all that plan. Um, if there's no more questions, we'd like to continue with our presentation. Con uh, Linda will now present about some findings of the statement of needs. Thanks, Tam. Um, in the next few slides, we're going to highlight a subset of the metrics that we looked at, and we'll summarize um, some of the key findings from the statement of needs. So um, the information we're presenting reflects a typical weekday. And I wanted to give you some good news first. More jobs are accessible to San Francisco residents in 2050. There is also a greater absolute increase in the number of jobs that are accessible by transit than there is by auto. This tells us that San Francisco and other cities are putting jobs closer to transit or our planned transit improvements are having a positive effect on accessibility, meaning our transit investments are generally going to the right places. Note that people can still get a lot more to a lot more jobs by car in 2050 compared to transit. To meet our goals, the strategies we develop in the next phase of Connect SF should strive to make more jobs re reachable by transit. Despite population and job growth, overall commute times changed little. Residents who live on the outer edges of, edges of the city still tend to have longer commutes as shown by the darkest red on the map. While it's good that the average commute times are not changing, the pink shows that commutes in the southern neighborhoods are growing longer, while the teal tells us that commutes in areas of south of Market and some of the eastern areas are getting shorter. This is one of the metrics where we are seeing uneven outcomes across the city. In addition to citywide analysis, we wanted to look at our results with an equity lens. For that reason, we looked at how the transportation network is working for communities of concern in the future. Communities of concern are defined by MTC as populations and uh, communities that are considered to be disadvantaged or vulnerable. People who live in areas identified as COCs have shorter commute times and better access to transit now and in the future. However, in the future, commute times for communities of concern worsen, and the share of communities of concern with high access to high quality transit declines. And access to high quality transit is defined as living within a quarter mile of a rapid bus or light rail stop, or half a mile from a BART, Caltrain, or Muni Metro stop. We also see that everyone is increasing their job access to jobs, but COCs are not seeing as large of, as, as an increase as non-COCs. This tells us that to meet our goals, we need to focus on creating equitable outcomes for COCs. Now let's look at how people get around the city. San Francisco is already one of the most sustainable cities in the country when it comes to transportation. The city is pushing itself to go even further and has set an aggressive goal of having 80% of trips by sustainable modes by 2050. According to the model, overall commute share will not change drastically by 2050, absent new policies and transportation um, infrastructure investments. What does the model say about trends citywide? Trips by all modes of travel are increasing due to more populations and, excuse me, by, due to more people and jobs. The greatest absolute increase in trips is on transit, but trips using auto modes increases more than trips using sustainable modes. The greatest relative increase in trips is by TNCs. At the neighborhood level, um, we're losing ground in neighborhoods that have typically had the highest sustainable mode usage. San Francisco's already low person miles driven helps the Bay Area achieve its greenhouse gas reduction goals in 2050. Personal miles driven measures the amount of driving done for all trips to within 
and from San Francisco. While personal miles driven per capita in San Francisco is less than half the region as a whole, we see this number increasing a fraction while it drops in the Bay Area overall. Since our personal miles driven numbers are already so low, it is more challenging for San Francisco to do better in the future. We risk losing ground in neighborhoods that have typically been doing the best and have had the lowest personal miles driven per capita, as shown by the dark red. We're doing slightly better in neighborhoods that have typically had the highest personal miles driven per capita, as shown by the white portions of bars. This slide represents miles driven and greenhouse gas emissions for all cars driving in San Francisco. While overall driving is project projected to increase, our emissions are anticipated to fall. We anticipate emissions from transportation to decline due to technological advancements and continued, continued fuel efficiencies as adopted in state law. However, our city has set ambitious goals of eliminating emissions that we will not meet without implementing additional strategies. The model results also project an increase in traffic congestion in 2050. This tells us that we'll need policies to manage congestion and make better use of our limited roadway space. Without intervention, speed, roadway speeds will drop, especially during the peaks in midday, about, down about 15% over 30 years. This chart shows the change in speed for all roadways, including freeways. The greatest speed declines are in those neighborhoods that are experiencing the greatest growth and on freeways. Transit also becomes more crowded despite our planned service and capacity increases. The share of passenger hours on Muni that are crowded increases from 18% to 23%. This figure shows that buses are the workhorses of San Francisco's transit, transit system with more than double the passenger hours of rail. Muni crowding is worse on Muni rail than on buses, and the share of passenger hours on Muni rail that are crowded increases from 24 to 32%. Transit crowding continues to persist for access to downtown. It is expected to be pronounced on the Market, Mission, and Central Subway and Transbay corridors. In summary, we are seeing planned growth um, increasing jobs, housing and jobs. We also know that the gap between jobs and access, um, jobs access by transit and by car is closing with residents gaining a significant increase in the jobs that they can access by transit. And then while it's good that the average commute times are not changing citywide considering our expected growth, performance is uneven across different parts of the city. Through our statement of needs analysis, we recognize that our planned investments won't get us to where we need to be in 2050. To move towards the vision, we will need to create equitable outcomes for communities of concern. We need to do more to advance towards our citywide sustainability goals, and we need to manage congestion and improve transit service to achieve equity, environmental sustainability, and economic vitality. We've shared a snippet of what will be in the full Statement of Needs report, which we will release in late summer. There are some areas of the study that we do not currently model in the future, such as fatal collisions and injuries on our streets, or demographic um, changes such as ethnicity and disability status. These are, these are areas that are important, and we've compiled a comprehensive collection of available present-day data to assess our current conditions. These include our progress towards Vision Zero, project delivery metrics, and maintenance and repair needs. Um, and all of these results will be included in our statement of needs. So I'd like to pause here to respond to some of your questions. So it looks like we have three questions. Um, the first is, how do we anticipate transportation patterns and commute change? if population grows more quickly than jobs? Do we anticipate the jobs will grow in the same areas as we are seeing growth now? Um, so I think we talked about uh, our growth a little bit, and this is definitely a place where you also can explore where the city is growing. 
on our interactive visualizations. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so th it, this is a nuanced question in terms of how commute patterns are changing. So we are adding population closer to jobs in some places, and we are adding more jobs to the city in general. Um, but we are seeing some of our regional connections getting more crowded, and so people are making different decisions in the future about where they choose to work. Um, this is Tam from the Planning Department, and I'll add to the second part of the question about do we anticipate that the jobs will grow in the same areas we are seeing growth now. Um, for the most part, yes. Um, there are policies like ADUs, Home SF, and so forth that will increase some housing in throughout the city, but most of the growth is concentrated in the northeastern part of the city, as you saw in slide 10. That will be areas like the Transit Center, District Plan, um, Central Soma, and so forth. And th those areas will see both housing and, gro and job growth. So the second question is, why do re uh, downtown residents drive more in the future? Um, so this is one of the things where we're going to look more closely into this metric in the next phase of work. But we also do know that a lot of the short trips that have typically been taken by walking and biking and transit are being taken on autos. Um, part of this has to do with um, people living uh, just at the availability of, of TNCs, and then there's other pieces that we don't quite know that we need to look into more. Um, the next question is, is there a way to look at the metrics by neighborhood based on time of day, and certain communities rely on TNCs um, when service to their neighborhood stops. Um, this is a question I think, oh, A, I would be interested to understand which metrics we would want to look at by time of day. Um, we have some time of day metrics, um, and, but typically those are broken into um, larger buckets of commute time, so an early a.m., an a.m. period, a midday, and an after afternoon and evening peak uh, time periods. So please let us know what um, which, which metrics you'd like to see. Okay, um, so thanks for the comments about tr transit crowding. We know that this is a uh, a relative judgment, um, but we used our official measurements for what capacity is considered. Um, and for COCs um, or communities of concern, we are using the MTC Metropolitan Transportation Commission's definition. Um, there's about seven different components to that that make up whether we define a um, census block district as a community of concern. And it, it, it's basically two or more of um, those uh, components that if the census block has a majority of people who are experiencing that condition, it is considered a community of concern. Did the transportation analysis incorporate autonomous vehicles, which may or may not be widespread in 2050, and how uh, did it incorporate emerging forms of micro-mobility? I'm going to hand this off to Linda Meckel, who's from the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, to answer this question. Thanks, Camille. Um, so I think your question really speaks to part of my answer, which is it may or autonomous vehicles may or may not be widespread in 2050. Our baseline analysis only includes things that we know are certain um, in, that we know exists today and can be that we have data to ground truth our future um, projections. So, for example, we do include um, TNCs because of the TNCs today data that the Transportation Authority was able to collect. We don't include any emerging forms of micro mobility because we do not have robust data on those forms of transportation yet. Um, and they're not, they're not a huge percentage of the overall trips that we see on a day-to-day. -day. We do know that they, 
they are existing, and we've come up with several ways that we are looking at these, um, how micromobility may be used on a short trip basis. Um, so actually looking at trip lengths overall versus like the mode of travel that is applied to those current trip lengths. That is not included in the analysis that we're showing you today, but it has been included in some of our thinking. Um, <clears throat> in addition, um, so, and we are also do it, doing some research on autonomous vehicles and doing some testing in our 2050 model to kind of better understand how the transportation system relates to autonomous vehicles. However, that is not a part of our baseline um, for 2050 currently. So it will be included in some of our thinking as we move into the project concept development phase, but is not currently what we are projecting and what you're seeing on the slide. Um, we do have another question that is uh, looking at slide number 20. And it says, why is it that car mile increase in those neighborhoods that have the most public transit and possibly the shorter trips? Um, this is actually due to, so our model is a very simplistic, it's complicated, however, it is simplistic in many ways in terms of it takes into account cost and the value of time. And so those shorter trips are actually being consumed by um, modes that are such as TNCs because the cost of TNCs is relatively cheap in the future. Um, so the time plus money um, in val overall value of time and becomes the option that they want to take. Um, and so that is part of the reason we are seeing that mode shift happen. What regulatory changes do your TNC predictions include? <clears throat> and I, the answer is uh, the model it only includes TNC data usage um, that is calibrated to the TNC's today report. Um, so there aren't regulatory changes included in the baseline model. And Kansai will add to that. Uh, and I just wanted to, I, this is Kansai Uchida from the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. I just wanted to add that the reason we don't include those regulatory changes like the one listed are because the point of this exercise were, was to forecast uh, what the future would look like if we don't make changes like this. Uh, in doing that, we hope that the gaps that we see will point us toward the regulatory changes and other policies that are most needed. And that's something we're going to study in the streets and freeway study that we'll talk about a little later. Okay, thank you guys so much for those questions. We're going to continue the presentation, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Kanzai. Thank you, Linda. Uh, to, as in the slides you just saw, uh, this analysis tells us that our existing transportation system already provides a high degree of access and sustainability, uh, but we need to make more investments to meet the aggressive goals we've set for ourselves as a city. So how do we achieve this? Uh, in phase two, uh, the transit corridor study and the streets and freeway study, uh, with your help, will identify major project concepts for new investments, as well as policies that will seek to address the challenges that, that we've identified today. Uh, those concepts and policies will be formalized in the San Francisco Transportation Plan, uh, and this will uh, help identify San Francisco's local priorities in the regional plan day area. Uh, it's important for these priorities to be included in the regional plan to ensure eligibility for state and federal funding. Uh, additionally, our goals, objectives, policies, and priorities will be included in a new transportation element for San Francisco's general plan. Uh, the transportation element will guide the work of groups that deal directly and indirectly with city streets, uh, local and regional transportation, uh, and land developments. Uh, we want to be sure you're aware of the 
uh, opportunities for engagement uh, that are coming up, including the interactive maps we've developed related to uh, the data you just saw. Uh, we have them for the, some of these metrics, uh, jobs and housing growth, uh, jobs accessibility, uh, commute times, transit crowding, personal miles driven, and trip making patterns. And these maps can all be found on the Connect SF website uh, at the address you see on the screen. Uh, you can also find the maps by going to connectsf.org and clicking on the What's Happening Now icon on the homepage. Uh, these maps will give you a baseline understanding of how San Francisco's transportation system is performing today and how it's projected to perform in the future. Uh, the analysis informs us of where we'll need to focus our investments uh, as we move forward. And within each map, there's also an area where you can provide feedback. Then uh, throughout spring and summer 2019, we'll be conducting outreach on the statement of needs. Uh, then in the fall, we'll have workshops on the transit corridor study and streets and freeway study. Uh, we're also offering to provide presentations to groups we previously engaged with, and we'd welcome your suggestions for other groups we should reach out to. Uh, so if you'd like to request a, a presentation to your group, uh, the email address is there on the screen. Now, uh, I will turn it over to Tam to walk you through one of the maps. Thanks, Kanzai. To give you a sense of the map, we want to go through the personal miles driven map with you, or it's vehicle miles traveled. And these are miles that you, I, and our San Francisco neighbors drive in San Francisco. This map shows the average personal miles driven in 2015 and 2050 by home location. These estimates are summarized in travel analysis zones, TAZs, and TAZs are spatial units that amount to several city blocks, and they're a common unit, they're a common unit of geography that is used for travel modeling and analysis. So in this map, the lighter colors show less miles of driving, and the darker colors show more miles of driving. So right now, the, um, the map shows it for 2015. And in this scenario, people in the western and southern parts of the city in particular are driving more than people in other parts of the city, as you can see by the darker red colors for those areas. When we look at the map for changes between 2015 and 2050, and you can do that by clicking on, on the Teal Change button, we can see lots of tabs TAZs in the western part of the city that have less driving, the light teal and the regular teal color. However, some, in some of our more walkable neighborhoods, downtown, south of Market, and parts of North Beach and Chinatown, we see that more people are driving more miles. So there are additional map layers you can look at, including communities of concern, the high injury network, major parks and supervisor district boundaries. So we will really welcome you or we will invite you to play around with these buttons and other parts of the map so you can learn about the analysis that we did and hone in on areas that you're curious about. Um, we're, ha we're happy to answer any questions you might have related to them. And we do have a question here. It is, is there a way to look at the metrics of mode but transit is there a way to look at the metrics of mode of transit by neighborhood? If we can see comparison based on time of day, since certain communities rely on TNCs on transit infrastructure will not meet the needs in 2050. Um, Linda's gonna take this question. Thanks. Um, so mode of transit by neighborhood. Um, so I think what this question is asking is that some basically saying that transit is not available in some neighborhoods at certain times of day, like late night and things like that. Um, so the I will say that the TNC question is a nuanced one in terms of, you know, if people are taking TNCs at the peak periods um, and peak times and not and when transit is available, we definitely won't be meeting our needs in, this, in 2050. It's a relatively small amount of trips that are being taken in those off-peak periods um, by TNCs. So we do, we do know that, and um, we can, I will work with our uh, 
our modeling folks to see if we can come up with a nuanced comparison of time of day. Um, and we'll see if we can put this into the statement of needs report. So we also have a question, is there still an opportunity today to make up the gap in future needs? And Kansai is going to take that question. And I, I will also add that you know, part of our work here is to look at what will happen in 2050 if no other plans and policies were put in place. What would the city look like? And does the city, what the city will look like, will that, does that meet our vision? So our work is to figure out what our needs are to get to our vision. Uh, yes, and to this question, uh, there's absolutely still an opportunity to make up uh, the gap that we see here. Uh, the modeling that we've done is a planning tool to identify uh, where we'll need to focus our efforts in order to meet the Connect SF vision goals we shared at the beginning of the presentation. And the way we're going to uh, make up the gap is through the strategies and investment uh, projects that we'll identify in the transit corridor study and the streets and freeway study. So this will identify where we need major transit investments as well as new transportation policies and potentially infrastructure projects involving our streets and freeways. Uh, together, these investments and strategies will help move us closer to the goal and to close the gaps that we see uh, in the 2050 baseline analysis that we've done. That's the last question we received on the, on the software. Assuming that there are no more questions, I'd like to thank you all for providing your questions and contributing. Remember that this is just one map of one metric that we developed, and we want you to take a look at the other ones too because they're just as information rich. The other maps are jobs and housing growth, jobs accessibility, commute times, transit crowding, and trip making patterns. Oh, it looks like we're getting one more question in. Will you be sharing this information with the public? Yes, so we have been making presentations to all three agencies, boards and commission. This webinar will also be available on our website as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Additionally, our full statement of needs that has not just these metrics we covered today, but all the metrics we looked at, that will be available by the end of the summer as well. And we will let the Futures Task Force know via our emails to you about the progress of that. Is there data or maps on residents versus jobs for each neighborhood? Yes, there is. And I mean, take a look at the jobs and housing growth, <clears throat> jobs and housing growth map that will show you that. And you can click in, click down to the TAZs to get more information by TAZ for each of the parts of San Francisco. So you can see like where you live, where your family member lives, and information for that particular area. For the second question, does this suggest express buses and a rapid a rapid circumferential route encircling the city? Well, um, well, um, you, you, one might think that, but part of our following studies is to look at the emerging, to identify transit corridors in the city that would have high demand and serve the population, major population and employment areas for San Francisco. <clears throat> so that's part of our fall on site is to identify those priority corridors that would help us meet the demand that we see here in 2050. What about people coming into San Francisco from East Bay, North Bay, and South Bay? Linda, I'd like this question. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the question is asking, are we including people coming into the North Bay or coming into San Francisco from the East Bay, North and South in our analysis? And the answer is yes. 
So our um, our analysis does look at trip making patterns and um, numbers of folks coming in into San Francisco. Um, and if you would like to look at the travel patterns um, map or, or its diagram, it is, um, does show the types of flows that you're seeing from specifically the East Bay, North and South, in addition to different neighborhoods in the city. And you can look at those between 2015 and 2050 as well, as well as the change and the types of um, modes of transit that they're taking. So whether it's transit, walking and biking, et cetera. And we're happy to take questions on those um, components as well. Um, and then, but if there is a follow-up question, please do let us know. That brings us to the end of the webinar. On behalf of my Connect SF partners and myself, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. And also thank you for your questions. We hope that you found this webinar informative. And as mentioned, we will be posting a recording of this webinar and slide presentation at our website, which is connectsf.org. We're going to sign off now, but remember, you can always reach out to us at the following email address, connectsf at sfgov.org. Thank you and have a good day. Goodbye.